Here she is, she's been sort of alone for so long, and now all of a sudden she's having this interaction oh, right. with a man, and I'm rooting for him to be that prince. This is way more fun, by the way, than couples therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laura Heck, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified Gottman therapist and uh, co-host of Marriage Therapy Radio. I'm Laura's co-host at Marriage Therapy Radio, also a certified Gottman therapist and couples therapist in private practice in Seattle. And today we're here at Vanity Fair from our home offices and we're going to be analyzing some classic Disney relationships. Anna is a princess whose parents Anna. tragically died. Anna, you will be corrected by every every young girl on the planet will correct you. It is not Anna. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anna. Anna is a princess whose parents tragically died. She quickly becomes infatuated with Hans, a prince, and they bond over their lonely past. Hans proposes to her the same day they meet, which her older sister Elsa does not approve of. Hans appears to be honest and kind for most of the film, but turns out to be a cruel and calculating man in the end, only using Anna to become king. This is awkward. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not you're awkward, but just because we're, I'm awkward. You're gorgeous. Wait, what? What she nails is, now this is who I am. This isn't, this isn't a fake, fail, false profile pic. This is exactly who I am. I'm clumsy. I'm weird. I'm late. That's why I'm leaving. I, I... I better go. I have to go. Not because I'm scared, and also I'm not a I'm not a big deal. My sister's a big deal, and so you're immediately enamored of her, or I am. Mm -hmm. And of course, we think he is, and why wouldn't he be? In this, it's kind of like, yeah, you can be who you are. You can be fumbly, and you can <laughs> be kind of awkward, and uh, get caught up in your brain sometimes. And um, and still, look, there's this guy who still finds you attractive, and I think that I get pulled in quite easily with this. You can't marry a man you just met. You can if it's true love. Anna, what do you know about true love? Well, more than you. All you know is how to shut people out. Yeah, so I mean, Elsa's a little bit of a jerk, but she puts her foot down, which I think is really great boundary setting. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important to have those people in your life because oftentimes, especially in like the first couple of hours of meeting someone and they're interested in you and they're so handsome, it's so easy to get sucked up into all those hormones where you're purposefully, I mean, our bodies are literally pushing us toward one another to procreate. Mm -hmm. Limerence is this idea that kind of the beginning limerence? of a relationship, limerence is like fueled by adrenaline and novelty and it's not based on any reality yeah so i get it and i remember it it is important to have that person that third party that knows you really well that can be that voice of reason because clearly your body and your brain are not thinking logically at this point you're hopped up on all of your chemical drugs inside that are saying procreate marry this person lock them down i mean there's a reason why they're so excited or she's so excited at this point. well and you mentioned something a little bit earlier that was sort of lost on me which is that she has spent most of her life alone like literally alone not even not having a boyfriend but not having friends um yeah she's talking to pictures on the walls i started talking to the pictures on the walls hang in there joan barely having a sister and so I think there is something about protecting your own emotional intelligence as you enter relationships and getting the kind of feedback that you need, whether that's from your sister who's kind of a jerk or from your therapist or from your social network that she doesn't have anything about. So if one, but one person, if anybody comes in and busts that up, I can't imagine how addictive that would feel for her. If only there was someone out there who loved you. Harsh. All of us that were watching this for the first time, we were feeling this betrayal as in a pretty significant way, mostly because, in a way, Disney betrayed us. They did it for entertainment, but it was perfect. It was the perfect moment. All that's left now is to kill Elsa and bring back Summer. It's like he's taken his mask off, right? Like he's had yeah. this mask, he's concealing, don't feel. He's it's just like, like Elsa, she puts the gloves on, she's concealing. He puts the gloves on, he conceals who he really is. He's been playing a part this whole time. The glove comes off as the betrayal happens and it's kind of a way of being like, this is who I really am and this is the truth behind it Strictly all. Strictly from a therapeutic perspective, John Gottman is this scientist and he doesn't, he says everything with precision because everything's based on research. There's one sentence in all of his literature that I've ever found where he says something that's absolute and it's that every relationship that is struggling, 100% of them are struggling because of betrayal. And sometimes that betrayal is an infidelity. Sometimes it's a financial betrayal. Sometimes it's as 
simple as I've been wearing this costume for long enough to get what I needed and now I'm now I'm going to show you my real face. So in this way, I think it really invites you to go, okay, what what is relationship about? And she she ends up, you know, kind of exploring that with this other guy, the reindeer guy. Steph, what's his name? Whatever. The reindeer guy. Christoph. Uh, yeah, Christoph. And then her sister too, right? Her sister becomes kind of the true love story. And in this case, this betrayal is the end of the relationship. But um, if, for example, he was just being foolish or he was sleepwalking or he was drunk or, or whatever, where does repair then have to come about? And, you know, it's shattered in this case, but it's oh, I'm always looking for kind of the moment of betrayal that turns the relationship on its head. And Disney never gave us a chance to do that before. Like, we never, young girls who are watching princesses never had to ask that question before, which I think is really cool about this particular treatment in this particular film. Okay, so this is Snow White. So Snow White was born into a royal family and then she meets the prince when he happens to walk by her and of course she's singing this lovely song and it gets his attention. So then they start singing together and they fall in love. And when her evil stepmother, of course it's a stepmother, tries to kill her by feeding her a poison apple, Snow White goes into a sleeping death and of course she's only awoken from a kiss from the prince. My heart keeps I think this is where the trope got born, right? This idea that love at first sight and I'm going to fall in love with you because you're a good singer and this is the answer to all my problems and Disney's been recycling that for decades. And I think it's given us the wrong idea of what it takes to make a relationship work. It doesn't happen like this. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the idea of the one. I think it takes some real choice and choices removed from, from this whole scenario, in part because there's no other choices except for these seven dwarves. And two, she doesn't really have any agency. Once he kisses her, she doesn't speak again, right? It bums me out that this is the, the, the way that we've been training people and especially girls to expect and hope for somebody to come and rescue them. Interestingly, like the very first song that she's singing into the well is talking about her prince coming along and that's what she was wanting. I'm wishing, I'm wishing for the one I love to find me. Well, if he shows interest in me, now we have so many more choices. I feel like women are in the game and they're the ones that are seeking out relationships. But with the very first moment of her singing this song, it just felt like if he chooses me, then I'll just go along with the flow. And that is definitely not what we're doing these days. So this is fast forward like 90 minutes, right? Because they, they met in the garden and then she goes and does her thing with the dwarfs and the apples and all that stuff. And this is, I think this is the second time they meet. And maybe I'm a feminist and it's, and then again, it's almost a hundred years later after this movie was made, but I can't even fathom that this relationship has any potential for success. I mean, they've known each other for less than three minutes and she's better off marrying one of those guys. <laughs> Well, I mean, that part's true, that these dwarfs are kind and they've been caring for her and interested in her and there's been an actual interaction between the two of well, them. Well, they at least know who she is and, and have experienced her in relationship. This guy's just like kidnapped her, basically. So often we think, well, because we have this deep attraction to this person, that that's just going to open all the doors for us to have a great relationship. But in reality, if we have a deep friendship with someone like she had with the dwarfs, that's that's probably a better foundation uh, for the two of them to have a relationship yeah, together. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm I'm all for the friendships that she, she could have all seven if she wants. Polygamy is in. Polyamorous in. Now I'm super excited because we get to watch The Little Mermaid, and there's a fun fact: I've seen this movie maybe forty times, and Les Poissons is my go-to karaoke song. Anyway, Ariel's a mermaid princess. She wants to be a human real bad, but her overprotective father won't let her. She becomes infatuated with the human prince Eric. Then she meets the witch lady Ursula. She surrenders her ability to speak in order to become human and win Eric's love. Ultimately, Ariel sacrifices everything she holds dear to be with him, and her father transforms her into a human so she can marry and stay with Eric. If I become human, I'll never be with my father or sisters again. That's right. But you'll have your man. I love that. I love that that it's setting up. It's like once you get married and you're with your significant other, you can never see your family again. <laughs> well, I actually think there's some wisdom here because this is obviously the wrong path. But I think when you do choose a life mate, it is important that you sort of separate from your family of origin. Like in this case, that her dad is no longer the man in her life. I think that's ultimately a win. Um, 
I still think Disney is this is all super creepy because I'm gonna not let you talk to this guy, but if you get him to make out with you, then you get to be in love and be married. Okay, so here's the question I have for you, Zach. She gives up her voice for legs. Her voice is who she is. It's the thing that he recognizes her as. So what are your thoughts on this whole idea about giving up something that's so precious to you in order to appease or to be in relationship with somebody? She's literally doing that thing where she puts the um, false profile picture to like present yeah. herself as something that other than what she is. Although she's diminished who she really is because like you said, her voice is really the most, or one of the most beautiful parts about her. And I think this is right on the heels of her learning even how to use those legs. Like she doesn't even have to know how to use them because right. um, it's just not who she is. And and so even if he does fall for her, he's not falling for her. Well, a couple of things come to mind, but I just think in, in relationships, oftentimes we're faced with this idea that we can't make our partner happy unless we give up a part of who we are or we compromise a part of like a value system. And I just never think it's a good idea to give something up that is so central to who you are as a human being that you need to be who you are and you need to hold true to that core need, that core value. Yeah, and you're not talking about compromise, which is required. You're talking about sacrifice, which may not be. Yeah, the premise of this hug, I think, is some healthy differentiation, right? Like she stood up for herself. She kind of advocated for herself and he gave her the green light, which I think is at least the, the one cool takeaway of this movie. At least she has her father's blessing. That's at least one part of this story that makes you go, well, maybe there's not all that blind love at first sight stuff in play here. I'm just staring at this one screenshot and going, kind of going, oh, this is the end of the movie, but it's really the beginning of the relationship. I wonder what's going to happen to them. I think they have a lot of getting to know you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we live in an age right now, couples are meeting on line. They swipe a couple times. They'll end up in a bar. Then they may end up in bed. They may end up with a baby, but then they end up moving in together. Then they end up getting married. And they've kind of gone in reverse order from the sort of the more traditional thing. Realistically, it's about that conversation. It's all about getting to know you, right? Like developing that deeper understanding of who your partner is, their likes, their dislikes. And then from there, moving into a place of this is someone I can't live without. This is someone that I absolutely love and adore. And how awesome is it that they also like to make out with me? All right. So Belle is the social outcast. She's the bookworm. Um, and then this prince guy, Beast, was once handsome, but he was mean and he was cruel. And then this lady turns him into a to a big like boar, kind of boar creature thing. And then the only way that to break the curse is to learn to love a woman. Basically, he holds Belle captive in his creepy old castle, and every time they fall in love, and the curse is reversed. If you hadn't frightened me, I wouldn't have run away. Well, you shouldn't have been in the West Wing. Well, you should learn to control your temper. In some ways, you wonder if this is, like, is this an abusive relationship? With that aside, just looking at the evolution that people can have in relationships where they're changing and they might be softening, they let their guard down a little bit more. I think that happens in every relationship where there is an evolution of change. And, um, and she's... This is interesting because she's putting up boundaries for like right here. Oh yeah, totally. This movie often gets kind of compared to like the stories of Stockholm Syndrome where people fall in love with their jailer. But that's not what's happening here. She's definitely like making her choices and it's not because she's being manipulated or gaslit. She had her moment where she could have been like, hey, I, I'm free. I can go back to my dad if I want to. But no, she, how does she load him up on that horse? She's hopped up on adrenaline, obviously. She was just being attacked by wolves. She's all hopped up on adrenaline. There's love here, but it's it's been earned, right? It's been earned and learned, not, not just, oh, you're a good singer. And technically it's without sex, right? There's no kiss before they, there's no kiss before they, before their love is made official. Yeah, so here's one of the interesting parts about this is that um, the whole idea is that he needs to fall in love right and or like win her love by learning to love a woman learning to love an individual and if he can do that then he can change and I actually like that idea that he, it's within his control does that make sense because I think too often in relationships we feel like in order for a relationship to go well then our partner has to change and in order for him to change, he has to focus on himself and focus on focus, uh, loving another person. And I actually really appreciate that, that the locus of control is within himself. Well, and it also suggests that love is a skill, 
that can be learned um, and can be and can be developed. And in the end, we also know that love is transformative, which is something we haven't quite seen yet, except maybe with uh, I mean, Ariel's legs. But I mean, this literally changes him from the inside out. And again, I think that comes from Bell's strength, not necessarily his remarkable work, but you know, kind of what they craft together. Something that I think you're alluding to is this idea that when when you find a person that person has the ability to change you. And one thing that we look at as therapists is we look at the security of, of how you feel. So there's like these different attachment styles, right? You have like a secure attachment style, an insecure attachment style, an anxious attachment style, avoidant attachment style, whatever it might be. And the theory behind it is that if you are not secure, which the vast majority of people are secure, um, securely attached, but if you're anxiously attached or avoidantly attached, if you partner with someone who is secure, over time, your attachment style can actually change and you yourself can become secure. And I think that's like the transformation that can happen when you find that person, you can change. So Zach, what do you think the relationship is or the purpose of having all of these antiques in the house? What's the relationship? What are they there for? Well, I mean, I think that's a great question because as I was watching it, I was noticing that the, the candlestick Lumiere is actually playing therapist and that's actually these characters exist throughout all these movies right you've got um, kind of the birds and snow white and you've got in little mermaid you've got sebastian and scuttle all of the these disney movies have these tertiary helpers that i think represent different facets of whether it's our social network or even like rafiki and lion king is playing therapist even without playing therapist in the movie i love you here, you're actually watching the petals fall. And I don't know if the petals are falling on a daily basis, but we don't actually know how much time, but you know that time has passed and this relationship has evolved over time. And that's that's definitely something that's different. It's not a story of this kiss will cure you. It's more like, again, what we've been saying, sort of learning to love another will cure you, or cure him in this case. All right, so it's Bob and Helen Parr, their former superheroes forced to put that life behind them and live as normal suburbanites with three children. Bob misses his superhero past and agrees to secretly return to it for just one mission, not telling his wife. Ultimately, the entire family gets pulled into the plot that Bob's involved in, and they use their super strengths to fight together and win the day. When you asked me if I was doing anything later, I didn't realize you'd actually forgotten. I thought it was playful banter. It was playful banter. Cutting it kind of close, don't you think? You need to be more flexible. There's a therapist who has this quote that he says, you know, choosing a partner is like choosing the set of problems you're going to live with for the next 50 years. And so that's what we see at the altar there is that she's more kind of together and kind of organized and clear about her boundaries. And he's more of a fly by the seat of your pants kind of guy. And that's where he gets in trouble a little bit later. I will not be made the enemy here. You know why we can't do that. Because it'd be great. This is not about you. Okay, so first of all, this is probably one of the first times I've actually seen a couple in a Disney movie go at it, like, and raise their voices, like, raise the stature. I think that that was brilliant, the way that they raised her up and made her larger, because we do that when we're frustrated. We uh, we posture, like, listen to me, I'm important, and I've never seen this in a movie before where a, an actual couple in a Disney film is fighting. I think you made a really good point that... Um... She does start this scene in like kind of the, the, the posture of a mom. I thought you'd be back by 11. Which is difficult. Yeah. I think we do that. We all of us have these sort of ego states, right? Like we have a parent, an adult, and a child inside each of us. And often enough, couples get into trouble when they try to parent one another. Or in this case, where he's act, kind of acting like a child and she's acting like a parent. And it's not until they realize that they have to parent together that they both drop into sort of their adult state. And there's this debate about whether or not you're supposed to argue in front of your kids. I'm pro argue in front of your kids. Not a lot of people are. A lot of people are anti arguing in front of your kids. But but more importantly, I'm pro repair in front of your kids. I think that's what they do really well here is that they 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 stop when they realize they both have to become parents and and sort of de-escalate. It's okay, kids. We're just having a discussion. Pretty loud discussion. Yeah, but that's okay because what's important is that mommy and I are always a team. We're always 
United. It is important that we have conflict, but I think it's important that you're doing it right. If you are someone that um, throws objects when you, or a table, you're a table flipper when, when you have conflict, um, I don't think that that's helpful for children to watch you be a table flipper or lose your cool. I think that if you can manage conflict and you can have a conversation, you can stay empathetic, you can stay graceful, you can continue to listen to your partner and hear them out, and you're doing conflict well, cool. Let your, let your kids, like, Grab, a, grab some popcorn, kids. Come watch mom and dad hash it out. That's important. They're going to learn how to navigate the differences of an opinion. Conflict can be path to intimacy in this way, which is t technically Helen and Bob, no one on the planet can infuriate Bob more than Helen. And no one can soothe him better. And the same way for Helen, and is like no one can infuriate her more than him and no one can soothe her more. And I think we see them do both throughout the course of this film. This is my fault. I've been a lousy father, blind to what I have. There's another skill, though, that is equally as important, which is allowing repair attempts to be successful. He's offering up some kind of sort of mea culpa, and they are going to remain in relationship together because they're going to allow that to be successful. This is unique in that it's a family, and we get to watch the family dynamic. And we're talking about repair, and oftentimes repair could be an apology. And the thing that gets missed often is re repairing with your child. I think too often we require that kids say, I'm sorry for anything, but they're taught, I should say I'm sorry and I should apologize to adults, but it's so rare that adults actually apologize to children. And it just doesn't get handed out very often. I like this because Bob's apologizing and he's just, and I, I think it's important for parents or adults to apologize to children. So Zach, after watching all of these videos, one of the things that I'm paying attention to is just how relationships have really evolved. And I mean, it started off with, I've spent zero time with you and uh, I was attracted to you because of your beautiful singing voice. I don't think we've even had a conversation and now your kiss is going to awaken me from the dead. And it sort of evolved through time to the point where now we're watching The Incredibles and man and wife are going through some like actual things and they have a family and they're having conflict and it's just sort of normalizing what relationships really look like these days and it's interesting to watch the evolution in just like the last 60 years, 70 years of Disney's portrayal of relationships. I love that there are actual role models that are happening and what what's really cool to think about what we just witnessed is this idea that like the wedding is the end of The Little Mermaid. It's the beginning of The Incredibles. And I think if we can make room for that, there's lots more story than just the, the love story, then um, it helps people understand that there's a there's kind of a work story, that love is a, what we learned from Beauty and the Beast, love is a skill that it can be like actually learned. Um, and it's also work. Thank you so much Vanity Fair for this fun opportunity. And thank you audience for watching along and um, just sort of reminiscing our childhood <laughs> Disney dreams. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for having us. And I hope that, uh, hope that this was helpful for you uh, as it was for us. Cheers.